Hi, we're going to get started, and then the people that are still, ta still eating can filter back in. So what we're hoping for now is a, is a continuation of the conversation we were having right before we let you guys all go out on break. Um, that was a compassionate uh, bio break there that we were trying to throw, but it got a little out of hand. So uh, about a half an hour of conversation. So hopefully you guys have burning questions that you haven't asked yet or that nobody else asked that you're dying, dying to hear somebody talk about. I see some, I see some hands up. Do we have anybody willing to be runner for, for uh, stick mic? It looks like they're in the back, the stick mics. They have to be able to talk too. <laughs> okay, hands up again for questions and we're gonna let, um, there's the first one in the center. Hi. Does it work? Um, yeah. he, he says that, it, keep talking. I think it's on. Does it work? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for uh, organizing the event. Um, mm -hmm. It was great and uh, it definitely showed different opinions uh, and uh, all the concept of uh, inclusiveness and uh, opened also my mind uh, about a lot of the diversities and things that I may not consider in uh, my life right now. Um, and uh, I have noticed that uh, a lot of the discussion has been on uh, putting uh, the, a lot of the effort on the tech companies uh, and uh, how they can create an environment in their office that is more inclusiveness. So, um, I wanted to take the discussion a little bit from a different side also. It's like a lot of the tech companies said when they come to the point that they need to capitalize uh, and start making money, um, they have been creating uh, um, artificial intelligence uh, in order to keep people interested in the topic uh, so that they can uh, advertise uh, to them, which means it has created a shift in our population that has gone very extremely to the left or very extremely to the right. And uh, that is actually to detriment of society because it actually does create more uh, extremism, especially for people that may not really view inclusiveness as much as a benefit. And they just don't see the other point of view. So I wonder what is uh, your perspective for it and uh, how can we help and change the narrative from a tech perspective in order to try and uh, make also everyone aware of the other side more. Okay, thank you for the question. To, to restate, I think he's talking about the polarizing effect of chatbots and how, um, how can, what can we do to counterbalance that. I will say I, I'm, I've been concerned, you know, I'm old, right? I've been concerned about the gradual erosion of civil, civic discourse. <laughs> We're having a very hard time having conversations because we're so polarized right now. But that's an effect that's being put upon us to make us more, to make it easier for things to happen that we're not paying attention to. And what I mean is, if they, if they do something that makes the polarized edges scream and cry because it's so you know, weird, um, you have to always watch like behind the curtain, what are they really doing that they don't want you to pay attention to? Why did they create this little tweet storm about something stupid like Kofefe, you know, what was really happening back there behind that misspell is, is an interesting question. Um, you guys have anything to say about chatbots and, and polarization of civil, civic discourse? Um, so what I would say is that it's, it's a good tactic, like strategically speaking, because you're exploiting a weakness. And so if you want to bring something down, you look for its weaknesses. And a weakness that we have in our society is um, the way that people communicate with each other and racial divides are an issue. And so if you want to bring something down, you would work on putting a wedge into a weakness and cranking it open. And that's how, that's how you make the cracks. So um, I think that 
bots are going to continue to be really effective. Um, but the more that we work on reducing these weak points in our suit of armor, the less effective they're going to be. So actually, a lot of the responsibility, the onus actually is on us. And then as far as you also mentioned, um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, I used to be in, the, in a tele-immersion lab, and we did a lot of work with vision science and artificial intelligence. <coughs> and the weaknesses there stem, uh, certain weaknesses there stem from a lack of presence of people. Uh, for example, we inadvertently produced technology that couldn't see dark-skinned people. And it's because it was calibrated by a really wonderful uh, lab member who is white and was surrounded by white people. And just like the, uh, those original photo cards that are calibrated to a white complexion, we did the same thing. And then uh, it was unusable by people of color. That could have very simply been avoided had we had one dark-skinned person in the lab at that time. Everybody cycles through. It's like, whoa, we can't see so-and-so. That person wasn't there, and that's how the technology developed. Hand the mic back to you. My guy. <laughs> was that a good was that a good answer? Can we move on? Great. Next question. There's a bunch of hands here. Claire. Is there another one? Oh, sorry. All right, yeah, thank you so much for all of you sharing your stories today. It was really impactful, and especially getting the variety of perspectives and being able to see um, places where each of your stories uh, touch on some of similar things. Um, one of the things I kind of noticed was this uh, very quiet, kind of like after the sentence refrain of, I doubted myself, or I asked, is this really happening to me? Uh, even in the movie, uh, the woman who said that... Um, or finding out that she, uh, the one woman when she went to the bathroom, finding out they said, well, not you, or like mm -hmm. the other man, or uh, the woman who was pregnant, each of them said, I didn't know if I should like double down, I didn't know if I was being perceived wrong, I didn't know if there was something I had done to invite this. Can you guys talk a little bit about when do you double down, when do you reach out? I know you talked about community and how like having people to support, but how do you identify when it's you that has actually done something wrong or when it is something that you have no control over and just have to work around? Thanks. Yeah, so I'm gonna briefly tell you a story about a woman, one of the founders of the Grace Hopper Conference named Barbara Fox. Um, she's about 10 years older than I am. And when I met her, she was doing all the localizations for um, character sets that were more than 26 characters. And she was doing it, um, it was a hack around. They were, they were using unaddressed space to, to make that happen because Unicode didn't exist yet. So she had a small army of Japanese kids in Palo Alto banging away on these localizations. She used to go to meetings in Japan and she had a male assistant who went with her. And they, in those meetings, they would talk to her male assistant because he was male and he, he looked Asian. And sometimes they would stray into commentary about her in Japanese. And she'd wait until they got pretty far down the road of being ugly, and then she would whip out her flawless Japanese. <laughs> and the thing that was great about that, at least in that society, they would be so embarrassed, they'd fall all over themselves to make it better, because in that culture, embarrassment is the worst thing that can happen. And so she was using it to business advantage, but I always thought it was such a gutsy thing to do. You know, um, for my own self, I, women get called out on the net. How many people is this news to? Yeah, right. Um, I personally have been called out on the net my whole career. And I started early answering every single time as a human being. Like, wow, what did I do to you that you think this is okay for you to say about me? You've never even met me, you know? And what I found is it's a lot harder to be that person to the face of a real person than it is to a mythical icon out there in cyberspace. It, at least in my experience, about 99% of the time they will back down. And that 1% uh, that is just a troll you're never gonna win over. Maybe they're even a bot, you, they're, they're not even people. you know. So um, I'm big on, but I, I realize, recognize my privileges, my privilege that I'm not afraid 
of that. And I know that's a big ask for some people. Does anybody, do you have anything about that? Um, I was gonna say, I think from time to time, you are wrong. And it's, it's important to acknowledge that. Um, you have to use your judgment and sort of see situations where maybe you said something that didn't work out or you did something that made somebody upset. And sort of acknowledging your own wrong and not being too proud to realize that you messed up. And one of the things that I always try to do personally, and it came from a friend, it's not my wisdom at all, um, is instead of saying you're sorry when you do something to mess up, say thank you to the person who corrected you. Because yes. if you say I'm sorry, they feel the need to say, oh, it's okay. And it's not okay. You messed up. You need to be corrected. So say thank you that they corrected you and move forward and learn from that. Anybody else? Um, so I'm just breaking into tech. I don't have a whole lot of experience with, um, be closer. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with being rejected to my face. <laughs> um, but one thing that has helped me is to shift my perspective, like my thinking to really being able to sell myself as an individual because I feel like uh, like when you walk in expecting to be rejected because I'm black or I'm woman or I don't have the degree or the experience that other people have, um, it doesn't set me up for success. So I've just learned to value the person that I am and to value the relationships that I make and that has worked well for me. Cool. Thank you. Okay, next question. I think it was Ahmed. Sorry, I don't really know everybody's names. They're just the people that came to talk to me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, really appreciate the uh, opportunity to hear the different perspectives. Uh, my question starts with a commentary. I've been to a couple of events before where there's a focus on women in technology or women in STEM. Uh, the observation that was shared was that after about five to seven years, women become disillusioned with a lack of a career ladder. And it's basically a jumble of people doing things and there's no distinction, no achievement. We're all level threes, we're all level fours. There's no recognition of individual merit beyond, you know, you've been in, in, in time and you get, you get paid. So the question really is, cross-cutting different groups from age to gender to identity, um, if we promote more of a, a merit-based approach to what we do, um, I know open source does more so than some other places, but in general for technology, um, have you experienced things where you've got, uh, like a fellow program, people that are, that are recognized experts in their field within the company, regardless of who or what they are? And um, has it been effective? So it's an open question. Thank you. I love to talk about meritocracy. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, she's, we're laughing up here because there was a blog a while ago by a marginalized member of the Node community, which is just, it's so endlessly entertaining to work on Node. Um, this woman was uh, saying that the word meritocracy was problematic because it sets too high a bar for really marginalized people to have to prove themselves in some kind of pecking order or um, that, that was her understanding of it. And inside of Apache, which is who she was mainly picking on, um, there was a, it prompted a whole conversation about is there another word we can use that won't trigger people quite so much. They, they settled on duocracy, which is it's sort of the same thing. They mean to say people get, people get um, measured based on their contribution. That's what, they're, that's what they mean to say. Um, and they're trying not to pick words that, that trigger people feeling like they can't achieve or they can't surmount whatever that, that hill is. Um, so, but your question was about fellow stuff and you and I talked before. Uh, I found that a disused fellow track can be a useful thing in certain contexts because you can re retread it to be meaningful. And I don't see a lot of fellow communities inside big companies that actually have much meaning. Mm -hmm. So I think generally it's time to call them into question and see if they couldn't be retreaded a little bit. Um, 
it used to be when tech companies had more money than, than anybody, and they did for a long time, they also all had labs. And the difference between being brought into the lab or being on the fellow track were, had to do with, are you in product or are you in research? Nowadays, there aren't that many labs left. And um, so you know, it got kind of conglomerated, but it's still, it's a mess. It's, it's very hard as an individual contributor to find yourself on that track. And what Ahmed told me that I didn't know is Boeing is actually pretty good at identifying cross-company uh, contribution and, and raising it. He, even as a junior engineer, was, was tagged for that track because of his direct work. Um, that's the kind of thing that's supposed to happen in open source, but even at Apache, every time we do a member election, there's somebody who we all thought was already a member that we just ne missed it, that they never got asked. You know? So they've now written some algorithms to try to weed those, based on how much mail they write, <laughs> figure out who's actually doing most of the talking. Um, I think it's hard. As, as things scale out, it's really hard to keep track of merit. Yeah, there's a lot of literature actually now on meritocracy because it became such a bad word in the open source community. Um, the Node.js example, but there are, there are others. And the idea is, how are you defining merit and how do you define success to go back to what Denise and I were talking about a little while ago, right? It's different for everybody. And also, while open source can keep you anonymous to a certain degree because you're contributing and you're working virtually online, I've talked to a lot of women, so I'll just speak in that context, who you know, will go to a mailing list of a particular project and they're not even going to attempt to you know, try to get merit because it's so visceral, the, the engagement, right? That's not every open source software project. I love open source. Love it. <laughs> but right, this does exist. And so that alone keeps some marginalized groups out because they don't, like, th this is the difference between diversity and inclusiveness, right? How do you create an inclusive community so that you attract a diverse, you know, talent pool? So anyways, there's lots of stuff out there on that, and it's a dicey topic, but I know at least in the open source community, it's become kind of a bad word. Meritocracy definitely has, yeah. yeah. It's a pity, though, because I think it wasn't a bad thing right. in well, its the, beginning. The way that you just defined it, too, yeah. absolutely makes sense. It's hard but I've been told by extremely marginalized people that it's really too big an ask to expect them to show up, like, even to put their hand up, yeah. but they still want the merit. Well, you mentioned Drupal earlier too, and like Dries is the, you know, the. Dries uh, and Angie, the two of them. Yeah, I mean, Dries did a great keynote this last year about, you know, it's great to think that everybody can contribute to open source, but like marginalized groups, especially women who are mothers and caretakers, they don't have the time to always volunteer and give before they're paid to do so. Right. Um, so again, these are like barriers to entry more than like, but, but the barrier to entry can sometimes, like they can't even start to move up the meritocracy right. ladder. Um, it all sounds so negative. That's not what I'm trying to say. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But as long as we're, as long as we're here talking about <laughs> Drupal, um, I served on the board of Drupal for six years, so I am biased. But I, I was interested in them because of their gender diversity. I wanted to understand why that was happening. And I think it's a multi-pronged thing. I think it's the area they're working in, which is um, websites. So there's a typical division of labor. There's all these uh, what they call lifestyle companies, which is basically a, ma a, a husband and wife or two partners who one of them is more create, more designy and is doing the design half, and the other one is doing the coding half. doesn't really say which one is which, but th that's how the division of labor is happening. And they're getting enough work to you know, run their household on that, on that income. Um, Drupal sang along in that key for a really long time. Uh, six, very successfully um, before they had their real, for, their real big challenge to that community. And um, so I think it can work, um, but you have to keep everybody kind of on the same page. As soon as Dries' company started getting very successful, people started grumbling. So anyway, did, was that enough, Ahmed? Okay. Anybody else? Oh. Thank you, Remy. <laughs> Okay. I thought you'd switched off. I'm sorry. There we go. I shouldn't have accused you. <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> um, I would also challenge people to unpack the concept of meritocracy and look at the arbiters of merit and who's assigning merit. Are, are the things that are meritorious things that the people in charge already consider themselves to happen to be pretty good at? 
Um, so that's one thing. And then you also made a comment about women self-selecting out. And um, one thing that you can do that's to keep women in a particular track is whether or not they are mothers, and I happen, I'm not, I don't have children, but to give flex time, part time, let people leave, give them the option to have a family, um, and nine times out of 10, women do end up doing certain types of gendered work around childbearing and child rearing and let them come back. This is a problem, a lot of people have babies. I have lots of friends that can't get back into the workforce because they can't find a part-time job. Mm -hmm. And they can work, but they don't have 40, 60 hours a week. Um, and making that available to women is one really easy way that we can keep women past that five to seven. You're bursting. <laughs> you are. So I, I went to school Wait, there's, a, there's one right there. Comment, exactly. I went to, a, to NC State and graduated with a young lady who moved back to Norway. And she moved back to Norway, had her kids, the government paid for her to stay at home, and she started her own software company at home. Right. Um, so there was definite support, and there was a question earlier uh, about the government support for women in, in tech, women in business. Uh, that was direct support for um, time at home. She had her kids, and she's basically worked at home, started a company, I think she works for another company now, but very successful. Um, so your point is well made, and it really sticks out. Um, success and incredible achievements possible with the proper support. Right. So thank you. Also, um, conferences that don't offer childcare are not being helpful. <laughs> there was a hallelujah in the back there, Claire. <laughs> okay. Um, another question. Thank you. I, I have a microphone. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so, okay, so we've talked a lot about um, individuals, right? And especially like in the documentary, raising individual women up. But what my favorite part about the documentary was actually talking about the community that was built. And so I guess I'm wondering, taking that one step further, if there's a space in the tech world for collective ownership of tech companies. So it's not just one woman or one person who fits the diversity token, but if a tech company or cooperative, I guess in this case, would be able to exist, or if that's too much at odds with venture capital and the people who fund this world. Well, I would say that's what Apache was set up to be although it was not set up around diversity, but it was set up around opportunity for people that were gonna work outside of the system. It's 20 years old now, so it looks like it's a venerable institution, but I'm here to tell you it was absolutely seat of the pants initially, and that's what they were organized around. So sure, um, given that that exists, given that Drupal exists and there are many other projects, there's no reason that there couldn't be a project that's organized around that. It would be very interesting, actually. I think companies too, startups. I think that, um, I think, I don't have a good example to share right now, but I know, in fact, follow up with me if you like or I'll get your card because I've read some stories about teams of women who are doing exactly that and they'll have, you know, um, equal share in the ownership of the company. There are a lot of questions that way. Right, so, right, I, I had a question and it seemed like some of it was touched upon um, by the lady in the green, but my question is dealing dealing with um, women in the workforce, um, looking at returnships, job share, um, different ways that women can stay in the workforce. It seems that the returnships, um, which is to help women to come back into the workforce after they have been out of work, um, being um, caregivers for others, um, whoever, but, um, and I see this more so with companies doing, are doing it in the California and New York area, but for some reason, it's really not being done so much here in the Carolinas, but even with it being done in California and in New York, I don't see where in it is totally helping women to get back into the workforce because it does not present the opportunities to work part-time or do job shares. So um, what are companies doing in this area 
and are companies making any type of arrangements for not only women, but other people who do want to work, but they um, need to work part-time or do job shares? So I think, I think that's happening in companies that have a hard time acquiring talent. So boring companies, um, like, no seriously. Um, and I'm now gonna name one because I just worked for them for five years and that's PayPal. Uh, they did a return to work program and they did offer part-time and, and job share and all that stuff. Um, it was pretty rigorous, like they'd take in 60 women and maybe 10 of them would actually get jobs. Um, there was kind of a boot camp feel to it before they made the offers. Um, Cedric, you, you paid attention to that. No, you don't want to talk about it? Well, the, uh, the official line is that I believe is that they are reconsidering how to uh. support it going forward. But the current result is there is not there is not an active program uh, running anymore. Oh, that's too bad, because they were doing it in India in addition to America. Um, I have a friend who tried to get in it and was unsuccessful, and she was really unhappy about it. So anyway, it's a good idea. There should be more of it. So it would be interesting to find out why it isn't, what didn't work for them, right? No, they didn't say that coming in, but they did say this is a bit of a boot camp and we're screening for the best candidates. They did say that. And I think they paid them for their time for the internship too. So it wasn't, they weren't, there was no loss per se. Yeah, it was, it was paid positions, but it, it was, I mean, it was absolutely full time. It was, it was not a, it was not a, uh, as you, as you say, it was not part time supportive. It, there was no Oh, see, I thought allowance. that they did in India. I thought they did oh. have. I didn't, I didn't participate yeah. with that one, but the, the, one in, the one in the U.S. was very, I mean, it was, you know, come in, work your 50 hours. And so about here. half of the engineering resource in PayPal is in India, and the other half is spread out around the world, so that's why it was a focal point. Anyway, to your point, ma'am, that it's a really good idea. There should be more of it. Be nice if, got, now there's something government could do. They could offer a subsidy for that program, and then everybody would win. I have one note on returnships. Um, I didn't know they existed until about a week ago, and I looked into it, and I was disappointed to find out that returnships means returning to tech for the, the program that I came across, which meant that I was not eligible as someone who is starting tech now. So I have a 12-year break where I, I took care of my kids primarily, but I was working in a pharmacy and in a bakery before then. I wasn't in corporate or any tech company. So uh, I think we have a long way to go to making things more accessible to people who are really trying to jump up a class um, for the first time. Hi, I wanted to speak to that, Nakimi. You talk, touched on some of this earlier and I just needed some additional action items. So I'm having difficulty reaching low-income women with children and trying to get them to come into IT. They don't even consider it as a career. And is there anything that I can do to, to change that or to make them understand that this is open to them? They do not have to be a mathematics genius to do this. Any suggestions? It's tough for me to suggest because I have had a lifelong love of tech, so it was, it's always been like a no-brainer, like I'd love to work in tech. Um, but I think if you're trying to reach low-income mothers, which I am, if you could... <coughs> Excuse me, sorry about that. Um, if you could somehow provide the support and let them understand that they will be supported, that they don't have to choose a career over their, over their family, because that's one choice that I've never been willing to make, which is, I think, why maybe it's taking me longer or I have to take a different path to get in. But if you could set up a support system where people feel like I can be a mother and I can have this career in tech and uh, the income, is life-changing, like we talked about, being able to build wealth and have things to leave to your children and be able to take care of your parents who might still be working into their 
70s. <laughs> um, just, just the income potential is, if you could drive that home that yes, you can earn this kind of income and you're capable of doing this work because people, anyone can be taught. Like there's a, a tech career for every, everyone. Like, you don't even have to be a programmer. Like there are different things that you can do in tech. So if you could just drive that home that there's a place for you, you can get paid well and you don't have to give up your family to do that. And, and make that true. <laughs> like if, if, right. if it's a 40 hour week, you know, full time, like then something's gotta give. But if, if it's true that there's a support for family and work-life balance. I think just the money alone is enough. That would get me in the door. I don't know. <laughs> also, you never know what impact you're going to have. When I was manager at Apple, I tried to help a woman that was a single mom. She was super good at her job, but she was a, an hourly employee, so she had no health care and other things like that. And I had an opening that I tailored to her, and I offered her a job. She was going to be paid $48,000 a year. And this was such a mind-blowing thing to her. She went home to talk to her family, and her father, who had never made $48,000 a year, basically told her she, she wasn't good enough. So she declined the job. And I, you know, I spent some time talking to her about how, why that happened, and I told her that I understood why she was making the choice, and I wasn't going to push her, but I wanted her to know that what her father had said wasn't true, and that she was being influenced for the wrong reasons. And um, she called me about 10 years later. She was taking her first management position, and she said, I never would have gotten here if you hadn't offered me that job. So it's worth doing it even if it doesn't connect right in the moment. So we're getting close to the end of our time. Oh, yeah, we I have a throw in a little on that too, Sorry. because um, I think people think technology jobs, and we're all work, and I think the majority of us work in them are really hard compared to a lot of hourly work. I've been in retail and went through a Christmas crunch and barely got paid. Right and you're there for 100 hours and for in a week or, or working an hourly job where you have almost no flexibility. When you work in tech, I don't know a major corporation that doesn't give you enough flexibility. You might work an 80-hour week occasionally, or you might do it on a regular basis, but you have a lot of flexibility to do other things in between, and you don't really have to work that many hours. So don't give up. It's not hard. It's a, keep pushing them. And you have to ask people, especially if um, everybody can do this job with a little bit of training. It's just, just ask them. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to everyone for being here. Um, Jennifer, one of the observations I was thinking about in the film with um, kind of the observation that there aren't any major female venture capitalists, I think it speaks to this broader decentralization of wealth and power that has to happen because as a white woman, I'm making 70% of what my white male peers are making and then women of color make even less than that, um, estimated about half, give or take. And, you know, I understand that there's a need for that to change, but it feels like there's, you know, when you look at women's history, there's constantly like this chicken and egg problem. like which thing do we go after first and will the other things naturally follow? Um, but do you know of any things that are happening like in the venture capitalist space or any um, initiatives there are like a women's collective to create a venture capital fund? Because um, when you look at the other numbers around it, like, you know, if you're a white male without a college degree, you're a tech genius. And if you're a woman with a master's degree, you're barely qualified for the entry level job. So there's like other issues surrounding it. Yeah, yeah. There's actually a number of female led um, initiatives around VC. Unfortunately, I don't think they're making enough, they're not having enough traction yet. But I would check out All Race, it's the most highly visible one, and they're doing good work. But there's also work being done in Boston with women of color in the VC space. So there are efforts underway. 
Um, but they're slow. They're too slow. I'm, I'm hesitating to go into great detail. I know we're running out of time. I'm happy to talk to you afterwards, too. But there is efforts there. They need more support. The problem with VC is it's based on a very specific computation, right, of, of ROI. And women-led businesses don't always fall into that cookie-cutter approach, right? And so it's expanding our thinking about what is ROI and how much return is enough return or good enough return. And that takes a different type of investor. Maybe that's a woman. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's a totally different type of venture fund. And those are, they, they exist. But we're measuring it by the wrong success metrics, in my opinion. Again, going back to that idea of how do you measure success. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. All right, so we got to wrap up now, unfortunately. I wish we could stay here, but we, we have some time out at the food to talk some more. And um, so please, all of you, stick around. And then I'm going to say the thing I always say at these events, which is if you have a small girl in your world, tinker with her. It is the single most successful statistic is people who grew up to be me had somebody tinkering with them when they were children. My dad used to let me take clocks apart. He, he thought that was fine, right? Uh, so I got the message that it was cool to tinker and that made it okay to be a geek. So that is the single strongest thing that you can do. Do all the other things too, but go home and do that one thing. And thank you all for your long patience and contribution.